welcome back to this course on Shakespeare's problem plays and romances. There are at least two kinds of problem child E.M.W. Tilliard writes in the introduction to his book on Shakespeare's problem plays. The genuinely abnormal child whom no efforts will ever bring back to normality and the child who is interesting and complex rather than abnormal. Hamlet and Troilus and Cressida are like the second type Tilliard believes. Whereas all's well that ends well and measure for measure are like the first. There is something radically schizophrenic about them. A spirit of gloom and disillusion and morbidity that exceeds dramatic propriety, Tilliard concludes. Helena, the dominant and domineering character of all's well, is the main reason why this is a problem place and looks schizophrenic. My contention, however, is that Helena's character and her distasteful plot to get Bertram are not a failure due to something unresolved in Shakespeare's mind, as A.P. Rossiter wrote. Following Shakespeare's departures from his Thor story, reveals that the poet calculated every aspect carefully. The poet wanted Helena to be complex and contradictory, problematic and, let's say, schizophrenic, as he intended the play's conflict to remain unresolved and the title to sound ironic. Due to the means by which Helena attains her ends, all is not well. The young woman is deliberately ambiguous and the play is ruthlessly ironic on purpose rather than due to Shakespeare's failure of handling the plot, the themes, the characters and the verse. What makes the play intriguing and problematic makes it unpalatable to many as well. Not to me. I, for one, fail to recognise the feebleness in execution, the lack of imaginative warmth and the failure of poetic imagination invoked by Tilliard, or the general failure in all's well to establish a medium in verse which will convey effectively the tone of the play, as G.K. Hunter wrote, in the introduction to his Arden edition. Such failure verdicts should be avoided where Shakespeare's plays are concerned. When one is tempted to think that Shakespeare got something wrong, one should be reminded of T.S. Eliot's verdict on Hamlet. So far from being Shakespeare's masterpiece, the play is most certainly an artistic failure, T.S. Eliot proclaimed. If Shakespeare can get things wrong sometimes, lesser intellects, are even likelier to get him wrong. The exercise one has to do in order to understand Shakespeare's intention here is simple and familiar to philologists of the old school. It suffices to compare All's Well to its source, Boccaccio's story of Giletta di Nerbona, the, th the ninth story told on the third day in the Decameron. I pause to say, yes, there is such a thing as authorial intention because texts do not write themselves with no purpose. And yes, it matters. And yes, the lucid writer and the critic, they are not always one and the same person, are well advised to take it into account if they do not want to get intoxicated by the fumes of their own theories. Now, Shakespeare probably knew Boccaccio's story from William Painter's faithful translation in The Palace of Pleasure whose third and final edition appeared in 1575. This is the summary in Painter's version. I quote, Giletta, a physician's daughter of Narbonne, healed the French king of a fistula, for reward whereof she demanded Beltramo, Count of Rossiglione, to husband. The Count being married against his will, for despite fled to Florence and loved another. Giletta, his wife, by policy found means to lie with her husband in place of his lover and was begotten with child of two sons, which known to her husband, he received her again and afterwards he lived in great honour and felicity. As Giuseppe Petronio explains, all the stories told on the third day of the Decameron end well. They generally present ingenious efforts to reach an eagerly desired goal, and the teller's attitude is one of admiration for energetic and ambitious, yet noble characters. Boccaccio's novella extols Giletta's virtue, 
perseverance and ingenuity, without reviling her husband Beltramo, though. Beltramo is forced by the King of France to marry Giletta, a woman of low rank whom he did not love. He swears that he would only consummate his marriage if Giletta can produce his precious ring and the son begotten by him, then flees to Italy, where he enlists in the Florentine army and fights against Siena. In Florence, he woos an unnamed woman. Giletta, however, comes to Florence as a pilgrim. She learns about her husband's intention to bet that woman and pays the woman to promise Beltramo what he wants in exchange for his precious ring. Then she replaces the woman at night and sleeps with her husband on numerous occasions in Boccaccio until she is with child. Painter adds to Boccaccio's summary that Giletta found means to lie with Beltramo by policy. Policy and Florence in the same line may have brought to Shakespeare's mind Machiavelli. Hence, perhaps, the additional ambiguity of Helena compared to Giletta. Although Beltramo is forced to accept Giletta as his wife and is tricked into lying with her, the Decameron story ends really well. The Countess explains her proceedings to the great admiration of the Count and of all those that were in presence. And Beltramo recognizes his twins, who were so like him. He admires Giletta's constant mind and good wit, perseverenza and senno in Italian. And from that time forth, he loved and honored her as his dear spouse and wife. Shakespeare transforms every certainty of the medieval novella into ambiguity. First, he changes and invents names and creates new characters, including the usual clowns and foils. Beltramo becomes Bertram and receives a foil, Perrault's, a garrulous, immoral, treacherous and cowardly Miles Gloriosus. This is the vice of medieval morality plays. The Capitano of the Commedia dell'arte, almost at times the fool. Bertram is uncommonly quiet and hardly ever speaks in the play, whereas Perel's is an unbridled chatterbox. In all respects, he compares best to Falstaff, young Prince Harry's evil angel in Henry IV. There is a second clown in the play, whom the Countess inherited from her late husband, this is a lowly practical clown, the voice of common sense, the typical Eulenspiegel, or touchstone if you will. Perels calls him once Lavage, which could be the French Lavage, the cow, but he is otherwise unnamed. The wise and honourable old Lord Lafeu, another of Shakespeare's editions, is the opposite of Perels and should act as a good paternal influence on Bertram. He also serves a practical role in the plot by providing a second wife candidate to Bertram. In the Decameron, the woman Beltramo is wooing in Florence is unnamed, but Shakespeare calls her Diana, the chaste goddess, as you all know. When Bertram first talks to her, he thinks that she is called Fontibel. The name suggests a bountiful and beautiful fountain, an accessible source for a young man wishing to quench his burning lust. Bertram hopes that Diana will yield easily. When she confronts him in front of the king, he is therefore not wrong to say in his defence that she was a common gamester to the camp. In reality, however, the girl has Diana's wit and she'll not be hit to quote Romeo's bawdy rhymes. Diana the chaste, who refuses to lie with Bertram, thus acts as an ironic counterpart to Bertram's own wife, who is all too willing to lie with to him in order to lie with him. For lying so, she does not lie, one may say, quoting Lysander. Most relevantly, Giletta is renamed Helena. By naming his feminine characters Helena and Diana, Shakespeare generates an ambiguity and an irony that Boccaccio never intended. Paris received Helen from Venus, the goddess whom he preferred in the earliest recorded beauty contest. In the Iliad, Helen stands for forbidden, adulterous, passionate, sexual, destructive love. Quite the opposite of all's well, 
for Bertram is no Paris. As to Susan Snyder writes, he flees Helen as Adonis did Venus and chooses Mars. This very day, great Mars, I put myself into thy file. Make me but like my thoughts, and I shall prove a lover of thy drum, hater of love. The conflict of Mars and Venus is a trite topos one may remember Arcite and Palamon in Chaucer's Knight's Tale. In Florence, however, the hater of love starts chasing Chase Diana, but ends up being hunted by her and by Helena, Venus, like some hapless Actaeon. These medieval and Renaissance mythological games may be obscure to the modern student who was not brought up reading Ovid's Metamorphoses, but they were commonplace in Elizabethan and Jacobean literature. Well, you see, Shakespeare is not exactly our contemporary, as some say, and he's often closer to Chaucer and Ovid than to Artaud and Beckett. The choice of feminine names is ironic in all's well as it is in A Midsummer Night's Dream, for both Helenas are loathed by the men they love. For some strange reason, Demetrius sees Helen's beauty in a brow of Egypt in A Midsummer Night's Dream and prefers dwarfish and tawny Herbia to tall and fair Helena. Likewise, Bertram fails to see Helena's universally admired qualities. The king, for example, calls her youth, beauty, wisdom, courage, and Bertram's mother appreciates her honesty, goodness, simpleness, and considers her a maid too virtuous. However, like Juliet and Cressida, this maid too virtuous is not very keen to preserve her virginity. In the first scene, she has a long and witty conversation about virginity with Perels. Helena starts by asking the fool how women may barricade their virginity against men. Perels urges her to lose it while it's still worth something, using the dirty metaphor that we have already met in Troilus and Cressida. Your date is better in your pie. Loss of virginity is rational increase, and there was never virgin God till virginity was lost, Perels argues. So off with it, while it is vendible. Not my virginity. Yet, Helena answers. The reason of that yet is her love for Bertram, whom she describes in Oxymora befitting a lusty male sonneteer more than a chaste virgin. His humble ambition, proud humility, his jarring concord, and his discord dulcet. Helena's name deserves further glossing, so please indulge. When he meets her, the clown Lavage recites a version of Marlowe's famous line, which Shakespeare also recycled in Troilus and Cressida. Was this the face, the cause, quoth she, why the Grecians sacked Troy? The connection to Helen of Troy is thus explicit in the play. Laurie Maguire and Alastair Fowler point out that Aeschylus punned on the name and called Helena, Helene, Helenaus, destroyer of ships. Shakespeare's contemporary George Peel wrote, Hell in thy name, but heaven is in thy looks. But Helena does not call to mind only the world's most famous adulteress. It is also the name of the holy empress who discovered the true cross. Helena's name thus invokes both debauchery and holiness, damnation and redemption. It signifies a veritable marriage of heaven and hell, of sacred and profane love. Forcing Bertram into marriage in Paris and then lying to and with him in Florence is relatively repulsive, though. This lying is ambiguous and problematic, for even though Helena lies with her legitimate husband, she also lies to him, which is, I suppose, a bit less legitimate. I know she will lie at my house, the Florentine widow says about Helena before even knowing her guest's purpose. How ironic! Lying is precisely what Helena does in the bed trick scene, Sweet Helena replaces Chase Diana in order to conceive a child by her reluctant husband. Monstrous desperate, as the king says. Helena's behaviour in Florence seems to be influenced by the genius of that Florentine 
deep, deep observing and sound-brained Machiavell, to quote John Marston. When Helena says, all's well that ends well yet, though time seems so adverse and means unfit, one cannot help thinking of Machiavelli. The play's title is thus contaminated by this ambiguity. In order to attain her ends, Helena is ready to do anything. She does not heal the King of France out of charity, but for a purpose. Our remedies oft in ourselves do lie, which we ascribe to heaven. The fated sky gives us free scope, only doth backward pull our slow designs when we ourselves are dull. What power is it which mounts my love so high that makes me see and cannot feed mine eye? The king's disease. My project may deceive me, but my intents are fixed and will not leave me. The king duly notes that Helena either has skill infinite or is monstrous desperate. Well, it is rather the second, I should say, for her skill is borrowed, but the desperation is her own. Act three closes with Helena's Machiavellian resolve to get Bertram into her bed. Why then tonight let us assay our plot, which if it speed is wicked meaning in a lawful deed, and lawful meaning in a lawful act, where both not sin and yet a sinful fact. But let's about it. Helena does not care whether Bertram loves her, but follows her purpose and entraps the young king by crafty perseverance. There are other smart and domineering women in Shakespeare. Think of Rosalind in As You Like It. But there Orlando is in love with her, whereas Bertram loathes Helena. There is thus something deeply disturbing and unsavoury in the way Helena obtains Bertram. I cannot suppress my feeling that she resembles some kind of spider weaving a sticky web for, a, for her unsuspecting victim. Her attitude bears a disturbing resemblance to Richard III's wooing of Lady Anne. This creature of will who gets her way, as Rossiter calls her, seems to be more similar to the scheming villain regarded as a disciple of Machiavelli than to the typical Shakespearean heroine. My intents are fixed and will not leave me, she explains. Remember how Richard III is also explaining his plans with, with obvious relish. Helena is not wooed, but wooing. Not won, but winning. Not the object of masculine desire, but devoured by masculine ambition and desire. But I leave this argument to my feminist friends. Helena's ambiguity contaminates the entire play and makes even the title sound ambiguous and ironic. Variants of the title in which ends carry, carries a Machiavellian hint are pronounced four times during the play, but the repetition seems ironical rather than reassuring. Before the plot is brought to fruition, Helena exclaims twice. Our wagon is prepared and time revives us. All's well that ends well still defines the crown, whatever the cause, the end is the renown. And again, all's well that ends well yet, though time seems so adverse and means unfit. The last words of the play, spoken by the king, are All yet seems well, and if it ends so meet, the bitter past, more welcome is the sweet. The epilogue, spoken also by the king, insists the king's a beggar, now the play is done. All is well ended, if this suit be won, that you express content. As already said, Helena's lines sound cynical. Her skill is great, her mind brilliant, her will sturdy, her desire overwhelming. But all of these are expressed too callously. Whatever the cause, the end is the renown, is a pure Machiavellian utterance, which makes Helena look like a woman with a plan a scheming upstart, a low-born ambitious minx who gets her way and becomes a countess. Francis Bacon's essay on nobility describes this perfectly. Those that are first raised to nobility are commonly more virtuous but less innocent 
than their descendants. For there is rarely any rising but by a commixture of good and evil arts, Bacon writes. The king's final words introduce an ironical note of a different type. Shakespeare's source ends clearly. Beltramo loved and honoured his Giletta as his dear spouse and wife. In Shakespeare's ending, Helena is only pregnant, whereas Giletta had produced male twins resembling their father already. Secondly, Beltramo receives Giletta in his castle in Roussillon, alone, not in front of the king, in the presence of his courtiers, whereas Bertram is brought to a shameful trial before the king and is forced to admit his adulterous intentions in Florence and is confronted with Diana and Helena eventually. Whereas Beltramo is eventually conquered by his wife's perseverance and intelligence, Bertram seems to hesitate. Will you be mine now you are doubly won? If she, my liege, can make me know this clearly, I love her dearly, ever, ever dearly. If it appear not plain and prove untrue, deadly divorce, step between me and you. Note that Bertram does not answer Helena directly, but addresses the king instead. His answer starts with a conditional, if. Although Helena has already explained her tricks, Bertram still seeks confirmation and consequently hopes for a way out. The conditional is picked up by Helena, who introduces the ominous perspective of deadly divorce. Of course, she is confident that she has all the right answers and that doubly won Bertram will be forced to love her dearly. Yet, she was equally confident that saving the king would secure her marriage, but Bertram did find a way to escape her. There is ultimately something menacing in Bertram's conditional. After all, he had been publicly shamed by Helena's and Diana's revelations, and his second acceptance of Helena is as reluctant as the first. Note also the complementary doubt introduced by the king's conclusion. All yet seems well. And if it end. Is all well that seems well? Seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems, Hamlet told Gertrude. It is quite the opposite here. It seems, but it may not be well. The king's second conditional includes the audience all is well ended if you, the audience, express content. But have audiences expressed content in the history of this play's reception? The critical reception and stage history do not indicate that. The play's end is thus doubly ironical. I started with the end because so does the title, but the opening of the play is equally ambiguous and menacing. The first line is spoken by the old countess. In delivering my son from me, I bury a second husband, she says. The pun on delivering calls to mind the prologue to Romeo and Juliet, which speaks about fatal wounds and lovers taking their life. Eros and Thanatos, birth and death, are thus united. The countess is delivered of a son a second time when this son has become a young adult and must leave her. But this second birth is also a second burial. Bertram is now delivered into adulthood, but also into a dangerous world. Like Hamlet, the play begins with a symbolic embassy of death and a hint of incest. As in Hamlet, the dark shadow of death cast by Bertrand's and Helena's fathers shall be lifted nevermore. The king expects the children to match their dead fathers. He tells Bertram, Thou bearest thy father's face, thy father's moral parts mayst thou inherit too. Yet, whereas Helena does have her father's healing skills, Bertram lacks his father's virtue. Boccaccio's story opens with Count Isnardo and his physician Gerardo of Narbona. In all's well, however, they are already dead. Death haunts the play. All is not well in France. The king is dying of a fistula. If Helena fails to heal him, she must die as well. In the last act, news of Helena's death on a pilgrimage reach Bertram and the court. 
the king believes that Bertram killed Helena and menaces to sentence him to death. At the end of the play, the threat of deadly divorce hovers in the air. None of these come from Boccaccio. And yet, death is averted on every occasion. The play is less bleak than the picture I have painted so far. Allow me now to spend the second part of this lecture contradicting what I just said before and thus showing precisely why this is a dialectic play, to quote Giorgio Melchiori, or a problem play. Old Le Fieu hoped that knowledge could be set up against mortality, and Helena does precisely that. Her art defeats death. The pessimistic king informs Helena that labouring art can never ransom nature from her inedible estate. My art is not past power, nor you past cure, Helena answers. Art thou so confident, the king echoes her. Art and nature, nurture and nature, as they are called in the Tempest, is a standard Renaissance topic. Here, nature receives its full meaning of mortality, but also of birth, and thus of social standing. Inedible estate refers to the king's state, to illness, and to human mortality in general, but it also hints at the social meaning of the word. Bertram refuses Helena because her estate, her walk of life, is lower than his. W. H. Auden reminds us that for an important aristocrat like Bertram, affairs with lower-class women like Diana are not dishonourable, but marrying them is. However, if Helena can ransom nature by curing the king, the sovereign can also ransom nature, like God in the Magnificat psalm, by lowering the haughty Bertram and elevating the deserving humble Helena. Bertram says, But follows it, my lord, to bring me down must answer for your raising. I know her well. She had her breeding at my father's charge. A poor physician's daughter, my wife. Disdain rather corrupt me ever. Tis only title thou disdains in her, the which I can build up. Strange is it that our bloods of colour, weight and heat poured all together would quite confound distinction, yet stands off in differences so mighty. If she be all that is virtuous, save what thou dislikest, a poor physician's daughter, thou dislikest the virtue for thy name, but do not so. From lowest place, when virtuous things proceed, the place is dignified by the doer's deed. Where great addition swells and virtue none, it is a dropsy honour. Good alone is good without a name. Vileness is so, the property by which it, should, it is should go, not by the title. She is young, wise, fair. In these to nature, she is immediate heir, and these breed honour. I painted Helena black, compared the beautiful virgin to the deformed Richard Gloucester and made Bertram look like the innocent victim of an ambitious woman. Yet, in truth, Bertram compares poorly to Helena. He defies both the monarch and his mother. The king calls him a proud, scornful boy, and the countess rash and unbridled boy. Even Perrault's, in his moment of false sincerity, considers Bertram a foolish, idle boy, but for, for all that, very rottish. A dangerous and lascivious boy who is a whale to virginity and devours up all the fright finds. Boy is an insult that mature men often use in Shakespeare. Antony refers to Octavius as the boy Caesar. Thersites calls Patroclus boy. And Ophidius insults Coriolanus by calling him a boy of tears. Bertram's rejection of Helena thus appears rash, immature, boyish and scornful. Although he dresses it as a principled objection, raised on, honors, on grounds of honour, the, the episode of the ring demolishes this pretense. Here too a comparison to Boccaccio is instructive. In the Decameron, as in the Palace of Pleasure, Beltramo cares for his ring 
and never takes it from his finger for a certain virtue that he knew it had. In Shakespeare's play, however, the ring is the symbol of Bertram's honour, but so is Diana's chastity, as the witty girl retorts. Bertram, who rejected virtuous Helena because her, because her lowly birth could make her a dishonourable match, does not hesitate to give his ring in exchange for a knight's embrace with an equally low-born woman. It is an honour longing to our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world in me to lose. But Diana answers wittily, Mine honour is such a ring, my chastity is the jewel of our house, bequeathed down from many ancestors, which were the greatest obloquy in the world in me to lose. Thus your own proper wisdom brings in the champion honour of my part against your vain assault. Bertram answers, Here, take my ring, my house, mine honour, yea, my life be thine, and I'll bid by thee. By giving away his ring, Bertram symbolically gives away his honour. Of course, the ring has sexual connotations as well. Bertram renounces both ancestral honour and his virginity by giving Diana the ring. Shakespeare here complicates Boccaccio's plot by making Diana give Bertram the ring Helena had received from the king. This is incredibly subtle, since both rings are a token of honour. As Bertram is honoured by his great ancestry, and thus by nature or birth, Helena was honoured by the king thanks to her art. The, king, the ring that exalted Helena threatens to doom Bertram, because the king thinks that the count obtained it by killing his wife. The nobility signified by Bertram's ring separates the aristocrat from the low-born maid, but it is also this ring that unites the couple, despite the sordid way in which it passed for Bertram's unto Helena's finger. Bertram's ring stands for inborn, then lost virginity and honour, but also for marriage and love obtained through art, not nature. I could keep glossing on the, on the symbolism of this ring, actually of both rings, but I think I have made my point. The play offers other delightful and meaningful symmetries as well. By leaving Helena before the consummation of their marriage, Burton tricks her in Paris. He intends to disgrace her in Florence by sleeping with Diana, but ultimately blesses her during the night when she conceives a child. Helena, on the other hand, tricks Bertram in Florence by replacing Diana and getting his ring, but delivers him of disgrace and saves his life when she resurrects symbolically in the last act. The old countess thought that delivering her son into the world was like burying him, and indeed Bertram's immaturity and lust almost ruined him. Conversely, the young countess delivers Bertram from death and from his own sins, and will soon be delivered of a son herself. Like Imogen in Cymbeline, Thaisa and Marina in Pericles, and Hermione in The Winter's Tale, the lost woman returns symbolically from the dead. Like a force of life, Helena rejuvenates everybody. The king, the mourning countess, Bertram, Perels, and even herself. Her transformation of Bertram, if such be the case, is tantamount to conversion, baptism or rebirth. Northrop Fry believes that the reversal of Bertram's libido from war and lechery to genuine life illustrates a myth of deliverance in the form of redemption. Helena's reappearance in the final scene has the force of a resurrection, of an epiphany. She has been through hell but has emerged victorious and radiant bearing new life in her womb. The play thus ends with all the Christian ingredients of a medieval morality play, like every man or mankind. Cognition, confession, contrition, salvation. The king says, Is there no exorcist because the truer office of mine eyes? Is it real what I see? No, my good lord, tis but the shadow of a wife you see the name and not the thing. And Bertram says, both, both, oh, pardon. I like to hear in Bertram's apology to his countess, the Count of Almaviva's repentant and sublime, Contessa, perdono, perdono, perdono.
perdono. But have the counts of Shakespeare and Mozart really changed? Have Helena's and Susanna's tricks really converted the lusty men? We'll never know. Or else All's Well would be a second-rate comedy rather than the great problem play it is. On all counts, Shakespeare has managed to transform Boccaccio's medieval tale into a Baroque pearl, into something disturbingly rich and strange. What was an entertaining and instructive story about art defeating nature, merit prevailing over birth and love over convention, became a complex text, perplexing and unpalatable to some, but certainly not a poetic failure due to lack of imagination, warmth and poetic force. Of all the birds that I do know, Philip my sparrow hath no peer. For sit she high or sit she low, be she far off or be she near, there is no bird so fair, so fine, nor yet so fresh as this of mine. For when she once hath felt the fit, Philip will cry still yet, 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 yet,